This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Defeated and exhausted by the Great War of 1914-1918, Germany suffered further humiliation when the Treaty of Versailles imposed harsh conditions that would lead inexorably to further conflict. Many Germans looked for political change to restore national pride and prosperity. And in 1919, there had appeared a new National Socialist, otherwise known as the Nazi Party, promising this. Beginning as a fringe political group, the Nazis, under their eventual leader Adolf Hitler, steadily gained popularity. In 1925, Hitler had issued his Mein Kampf, My Struggle, a personal philosophy of bizarre concepts that would become the Nazi Bible. Hitler believed that Germany had been weakened and undermined by alien and inferior peoples. Germans, he believed, were a superior Aryan race that should, through increasing military strength, overturn the Versailles Treaty and regain its rightful supremacy. To achieve this, Germany had to cleanse itself of all racially inferior beings, particularly Jews, convenient scapegoats both for the country's defeat and economic hardship that followed. Military power would be essential to reclaim lost territories and acquire more, especially those occupied by lesser Eastern peoples into which Hitler's blue-eyed, blonde-haired super race could expand. By 1930, the Nazi party had gained power through the ballot box, becoming Germany's second largest political party, and three years later seized complete power during the Nazi putsch, when Hitler, then chancellor, took dictatorial powers. Jews were suffering greatly through the actions of Hitler's brown shirts and especially his SS, a military organization placed above the law. With a slogan of one state, one people, one leader, Hitler began implementing his expansionist policies. World power seemed helpless as Germany started reclaiming territories it had lost, the USA being concerned more with its own problems, while Britain and France were reluctant to take any action that could precipitate yet another war. Unchecked, Hitler annexed a generally welcoming Austria, recovered the Tsar region, and began to militarize its Rhineland border with France. Actions greeted triumphantly at home and with trepidation elsewhere. Racial cleansing gathered pace, and even though Jews were numbered amongst Germany's leading musicians, scientists, and bankers, their intimidation and arrests would increase. Nazi military and industrial expansion wiped out unemployment and Germany prospered. New roads, Hitler's autobahns, of a quality never before seen, both aided rapid troop movements and Germany's growing industries. Highly advanced tanks, aircraft and naval vessels were creating military forces of ever-increasing strength. In 1938, this territorial expansion would continue when German forces entered Czechoslovakia and the Western powers reacted, although in the spirit of appeasement. War was prevented largely by Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's meeting with Hitler and his return from Germany bearing the dictator's promise of no further aggression. This scrap of paper allowed Britain another 12 months to prepare for the war that seemed ever more inevitable. Britain and France had jointly guaranteed Poland's security and when German forces invaded that country in September 1939, demanded their withdrawal. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit, 
Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. This ultimatum was ignored, and at 11 o'clock on the 3rd of September, Prime Minister Chamberlain declared war. Soon, Britain, France, Australia, and New Zealand would stand alone, opposing a powerful and militarized Germany. It's over. The white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow. Just you wait and see. The Second World War would begin almost hesitantly with a period that became known as the Phony War. Naval fleets are readied while British and French troops guard a strangely quiet Franco-German border. The USA, under its President Roosevelt, declares neutrality, but by September the 10th, neighboring Canada had entered the war in support of Britain and the Allies. German submarines and surface raiders attack shipping. By April, the war gathers pace when Germany first invades Denmark and Norway. And a month later, a sudden assault, the new Blitzkrieg strategy through Belgium and Holland, splits Allied forces and traps much of the British and French armies at Dunkirk. The miraculous evacuation from Dunkirk of British, French and Polish troops is followed by French surrender with a puppet government under Marshal Pétain being established at Vichy. In England, General de Gaulle is recognized as leader of the Free French. The Channel Islands are seized, and Italy's fascist dictator Mussolini, Hitler's ally, declares war on Britain, which with its empire and commonwealth now fight on alone. U-boat attacks on shipping increase, and Germany prepares to invade Britain by attempting to gain air control. On July the 10th, waves of bombers begin attacking airfields and towns in what became known as the Battle of Britain. Spitfire and Hurricane fighters, aided by Britain's secret radar systems, save the day. London is bombed and ports and industries attacked. In Africa, Italian troops invade British Somaliland and Egypt. To prevent the French Navy at Oran falling into German hands, it is bombarded and sunk by the Royal Navy. Bombing intensifies with many British towns suffering heavy damage and civilian casualties. The threat of global war intensifies when Japan enters into an Axis Pact with Germany and Italy. The USA now introduces military conscription, and in Germany, Jews are now forced to wear a yellow Star of David on their clothes. By December, British and Commonwealth troops begin driving Italian armies out of the Western Desert, while a neutral USA supplies Britain with weaponry and armaments. A massive air raid destroys much of Coventry in England. With Italian forces routed in North Africa and Tobruk captured, 
Hitler dispatches General Rommel and Africa Corps to stabilize the situation. Greece and Yugoslavia surrender to invading German armies, causing supporting British forces to suffer heavy loss. Rommel's Africa Corps, with its superior weaponry and armor, reached and besieges Tobruk, but is repulsed. Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, flies to England with secret peace proposals, hoping to end the war before Germany attacks Russia. What kind of a people do they think we are? <laughs> Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? Heavy German bombing continues while the RAF retaliates against Germany. On June the 22nd, Germany begins its Operation Barbarossa against the Soviet Union, gaining 14 consecutive victories. Stalin orders a scorched earth policy, whereby anything that could aid an enemy is burned. Preparations are made for Hitler's final solution that will exterminate all Jews. The USA moves closer to war by seizing Japanese assets and signing the Atlantic Charter with Britain. A German advance against Moscow is abandoned when the Soviet army recaptures Rostov, and with the Russian winter approaching, the campaign will be abandoned. The Russian front is now over 2,000 miles long, and German forces are stretched to their limit. Atlantic shipping losses are increasing to a dangerous level. In spite of its neutrality, the USA is becoming a major player committed to Hitler's defeat and supplying weaponry to both Britain and Russia. A surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor naval base brings America into the conflict. All allies, other than Russia, now declare war on Japan, and in response, Germany declares war on the USA. Near Moscow, a Red Army offensive in bitter weather throws back German forces, causing their first retreat. In northern Africa, the British Eighth Army recaptures Benghazi and forces Rommel's Africa Corps to retreat. Hitler now takes personal command of German forces in all theaters of war. U-boat packs cause numerous sinkings in the Atlantic and along America's eastern seaboard. In Germany, Hitler's SS begins to organize total Jewish extermination. Rommel begins a new desert campaign. U.S. forces now begin arriving in the U.K. in preparation for attacking Hitler's Europe. Jack, that's the G.I. Jive. Heavy German air attacks on Britain are continuing. In May, the RAF's first thousand bomber raid is made on Cologne when every available bomber is pressed into service. From all parts of occupied Europe, Cattle trucks are carrying Jews and others to concentration camps for extermination. Lidice, a Polish town, and its people are destroyed by Hitler's SS in retaliation for the assassination of its leader, Heydrich. By June, the Africa Corps has captured Tobruk, pushing the Eighth Army back to Egypt, but is held at El Alamein. Russia's Crimea is now in German hands, and attacks begin against Stalingrad. In 
Poland, Jews are being rounded up for transportation to a newly opened Treblinka extermination camp. General Bernard Montgomery takes command of the 8th Army and makes preparation to drive Rommel out of Africa. The US Air Force begins its costly daylight raids against Europe, during which it will suffer heavy losses of aircraft and crews. Unoccupied Vichy France passes under German control. In Russia, the German advance halts at Stalingrad, and in North Africa, Montgomery defeats Rommel at Alam Halfa. By November, the El Alamein battle forces the Africa Corps into full retreat. While at Stalingrad, the Red Army begins to counterattack. In Operation Torch, US and British forces land in French North Africa, forcing Rommel to fight on two fronts. In August, an amphibious raid by Canadian and British troops is launched on Dieppe in France, and although a failure, provides valuable experience for Dino. In Chicago, USA, an atomic reactor is constructed that will, indirectly, lead to the atom bomb. At the Casablanca conference, President Roosevelt insists upon eventual German unconditional surrender. The Eighth Army captures Tripoli. At Stalingrad, by February, Germany's Sixth Army has been surrounded and forced into surrender. And by May, the Africa Corps has also capitulated. The Atlantic battle rages, but British code breaking enables increasing numbers of U-boats to be traced and sunk. Germany's Admiral Donitz orders their temporary withdrawal. The US Air Force is bombarding German targets, and in Poland, Hitler's SS assault the Warsaw Ghetto, transporting all surviving Jews for extermination. Other Jewish communities in the country are now systematically eliminated. The RAF bombs the Ruhr dams in an attempt to halt its industrial production. In July, with the Africa Corps defeated, Allied forces invade Sicily, and by August, all resistance there has entered. On September the 8th, Italy surrenders, and in response, German forces enter Rome. Shortly afterwards, Mussolini escapes and immediately attempts to re-establish fascist control. Allied armies have landed in southern Italy and are fighting their way up the peninsula against fierce resistance. RAF night bombing of Germany intensified while US bombers operate in daylight. Berlin is heavily bombed and firestorms destroy other German towns and cities. At Tehran, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin meet to discuss future policy. German forces in Russia are driven back into Poland. In Italy, another front opens when Allied forces land at Anzio. Although fierce German counterattacks almost pushes them back into the sea. Inland, the ancient Monte Cassino Monastery is destroyed during fierce fighting. Berlin is now suffering USAF daylight bombing, and in one nighttime raid on Hamburg alone, the RAF drops 3,000 tons of bombs. In Italy, German defense lines are being assaulted and taken one by one. On June the 5th, Allied armies enter Rome.
On June the 6th, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Europe begins. Thousands of British and US paratroops seize vital targets. Particularly heavy losses are suffered by troops landing at Omaha Bridge. Southern England is now attacked by German V-1 flying bombs. In France, SS troops murder the population of Orador sur Glen, a suspected resistance center. And by June the 27th, US forces capture the port of Cherbourg. In Normandy, advance is hindered by easily defended hedgerows. But on July the 9th, Cannes is liberated. In the Cherbourg Peninsula, US forces take St. Lo and Coutances, soon breaking out into open country beyond. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army reaches and liberates the first concentration camp. In Germany, a group of officers attempt to end the war by assassinating Hitler, but failing, are executed horribly. In Poland, resistance forces attempt to seize control of Warsaw. Normandy battles end with German forces trapped and destroyed in the Falaise pocket. As Allied armies near Paris, its resistance groups rise. On August the 25th, the city is liberated, with General de Gaulle allowed to head the procession, leading his free French troops. By early September, German forces have fallen back to the old Franco-German. The airborne operation Market Garden attempts rapid seizure of Holland's Rhine crossings, but fails to take Arnhem Bridge. In the east, the Red Army's advance continues. Field Marshal Rommel, already wounded in an air attack, is implicated in the Hitler assassination attempt and takes poison. German troops surrender at Aachen, and Auschwitz gas chambers are used for the last time. In 
Poland, Warsaw is retaken by German troops. V-2 rockets begin landing on London and will cause great destruction until their launch sites are overrun. By December 1944, what is to be the last major German offensive of the war, the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes region of Belgium, begins with German troops smashing through US lines in winter weather. Until held up as they besieged the US 101 first airborne at Bastogne. When asked to surrender, the airborne commander famously replied, nuts. During this fighting, 80 US prisoners are murdered by the SS at Malmedy. In January, Montgomery, given temporary command of all US northern forces, waits until the attack falters as German petrol and supplies are exhausted before launching his successful counterattack. Within 10 days, German forces have been pushed back with the loss of 120,000 men. But a difference in method causes strain between the Allies. Montgomery wants to attack deeply into Germany, but Eisenhower's broad front strategy prevails. The Western Allies, with four million men in 85 divisions, are faced with two major obstacles on their drive towards Berlin, the Rhine River and the Siegfried Line that flanks it. They now advance through eastern France, Belgium and Holland towards the German border in three army groups, with Montgomery's British and Canadian armies in the north, Bradley and the U.S. 1st and 3rd Armies pushing towards Cologne and the Tsar, and Divas with the U.S. 7th and French 1st Armies making for Strasbourg. German forces retreat and are now fighting on their own soil with industries and cities being bombarded daily. This is to be a bloody and long drawn-out struggle in which the Germans fight for every yard of ground. Although bloodily defeated, they refuse to give up, even though hundreds of thousands will die unnecessarily and cities will be continually pounded into rubble as a direct result of Hitler's refusal to accept the inevitable. The war's ending will continue to be as bitter and terrible as any of its other constituent parts. On January the 12th, the Red Army begin their winter offensive driving forward in three army fronts. The first Belarusian front, under Zukov in the center, pushing across Poland towards the Oder and Berlin. Rokoskov's second Belarusian front, along the Baltic coast into East Prussia, and Koniev's first Ukrainian front towards Budapest in Hungary and Czechoslovakia in the south. German resistance is furious and determined, but the sheer weight of numbers of the Russian armies steadily pushes forward, driving the German populations into flight before it in terror of revenge atrocities. By the 17th of January, they force the Germans to evacuate Warsaw, which has been almost totally destroyed under the direct orders of SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler as an example to the rest of Europe. 
On January the 26th, during their relentless advance, units of the Red Army come upon Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest extermination camp ever built. Sited near the IG Farben Chemical Works, its Cyclone B gas was tested here on 900 Soviet prisoners of war in 1941. From that time to its liberation, some four million people, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and other Untermensch, or subhumans, are believed to have been gassed and burned at Auschwitz, while others were literally worked or starved to death. A week earlier, the SS had evacuated 60,000 surviving prisoners and forced them on a death march westwards before the Russians arrived. 5,000 left behind as too weak to march would be liberated by the Red Army. By the end of January, the Red Army has completed its occupation of Poland to the Oder, but Stalin, with the largest army in Europe, numbering 12 million soldiers in 300 divisions, orders a pause for his conference with Churchill and an ailing President Roosevelt at Yalta. There they discuss the war's final stages and how Germany is to be divided and ruled at the end of the war. The clear intention is to prevent the country's re-emergence as a threat to world peace, as had happened after 1918. I always wanted to waltz in Berlin. Waltz in Berlin. Waltz in Berlin. The early days of February see the Western Allies continuing their broad front advance to the secret line liberating eastern French towns as they go. And Uncle Sam will be leading the band. Eins, zwei, drei, one, two, three. Ach, du lieber victory. Aerial bombardment of Germany continues with attacks on any location believed to possess the slightest military or industrial significance. Dresden, ancient and beautiful, and the last untouched German city, is attacked on the orders of Air Marshal Arthur Harris because of its lack of anti-aircraft defence and the psychological effect it would have on the German population. Between the 13th and 15th of February, raids by RAF and USAF bombers using first phosphorus incendiaries to start fires in the city and then high explosive bombs to spread the fires create a firestorm that kills over a hundred thousand people, many of them civilians, refugees and POWs. In the center, the U.S. 9th Army launches an offensive which is held up in the continuing bloody battle of Hurtgen Forest. The last days of February see Montgomery's Canadian and British armies fight their way through part of the Siegfried Line to the Rhine, north of Duisburg, while Patton's U.S. Third Army begins an assault on the Siegfried Line in the Tsar region. By the month's end, it breaches the line on an 11-mile front and launches an offensive towards the Rhine at Koblenz and Frankfurt am Main. We're gonna hang out the washing on the Siegfried Line If that Siegfried Line's still there
On the Baltic coast, German forces find themselves encircled around Danzig and Konigsberg, fighting a desperate rearguard action as they try to evacuate East Prussia. While in Hungary, they lose Budapest and, despite a strong counterattack, fall back into Silesia in eastern Germany, driven before a relentless Red Army. Cologne, on the western bank of the Rhine, is taken by the U.S. First Army on March the 6th, its magnificent Gothic cathedral surviving almost untouched amidst a sea of destruction. By now, the western Allied armies reach a number of points along the Rhine. The U.S. 9th at Neuss, after a costly breakthrough, the U.S. 3rd at Koblenz, and the Canadian 1st at Xanten on the Lower Rhine. Retreating Germans now pour across the remaining Rhine bridges, destroying them in a vain attempt to deny further advance into their fatherland. But on March the 7th, an advance patrol of the U.S. First Army reaches, seizes, and holds the bridge at Remagen, disconnecting its German-led demolition charges so that American armor and infantry can cross. A widening bridgehead inside Germany is soon established, saving many lives and much time that would have been wasted in an assault crossing. Even though the weakened bridge finally collapses, it is replaced by pontoons. During the rest of March, the Rhine is crossed at several points. Montgomery's armies cross in the Vessel area after a heavy bombardment and parachute landing. Patton's Third Army crosses north of Vaughan's. The U.S. First Army breaks out of the Remagen bridgehead, as do the Canadians and British at Vessel. The Western Allies have the interior of Germany at their mercy. By the end of March, the Red Armies have advanced and established bridgeheads on the Oder at Stettin and south of Frankfurt. They cut off the last petrol supplies from oil fields in Hungary and across the Austrian border. On the 27th of March, they reach the outskirts of Danzig, and after bitter street fighting, the port falls on the 30th of March with the capture of 10,000 prisoners and 45 U-boats, a major psychological blow to Germany. In the last phase of this long, barbarous and bloody war, the Allied armies close in on the beleaguered forces of the Third Reich, forcing them back on all fronts. Secret negotiations for the surrender of German forces in Italy have begun in March in Switzerland, but the bitter fighting continues as Field Marshal Alexander, commander of all Allied forces there, mounts the last great assault on April the 9th. The British 8th and U.S. 5th armies advance over the Apennines north into the Po Valley and towards the end of April take the main town south of the River Po, while the Germans retreat to the northern plain. Part of the U.S. 5th on the west coast takes La Spezia and heads for Genoa.
On the Western Front, in less than a month, the Allied armies advanced swiftly through Germany towards Berlin, although a pocket of 300,000 German troops still holds out in the Ruhr Valley, surrounded by two US armies. But by mid-April, they've capitulated and their general, Modell, shoots himself. In places, the Allies encounter fierce opposition from SS units still loyal to their Führer and pledged to die for the fatherland, but in many towns surrender is seen as far better than destruction. During their advance, Allied troops liberate Belsen, Buchenwald and Dachau concentration camps. Most surviving concentration camp prisoners are suffering from starvation, tuberculosis, typhoid or dysentery, having been forced to work 16 hours a day or face death by torture or flogging. Others have been subjected to extreme medical experimentation. At Dachau, 32,000 prisoners are still alive, 30,000 at Belsen and 80,000 at Buchenwald. It is later estimated that over six million people died in concentration camps at the hands of the Nazis. With victims being gassed and then burned, their ashes were often employed as agricultural fertilizer. At last, the full horrors of these camps are being revealed to an unbelieving world. Across western battlefields, Allied aircraft control the skies, rocket-equipped fighters making it almost impossible for any remaining German armor to operate in daylight. Although the Luftwaffe fights on, there are few experienced pilots left and they offer little protection against Allied bombing raids that continue to lay German cities to waste. <laughs> President Roosevelt dies on April the 12th, 1945, and is replaced by Vice President Harry Truman. Three times elected since 1932, Roosevelt had come to represent the Allies' great principles and, as early as 1936, had warned the USA against complacency, stating, let no one imagine America will escape, that America may expect mercy, that this Western Hemisphere will not be attacked. Truman, more isolationist and anti-Russian, lacks Roosevelt's vision to an extent that even Allied unity becomes threatened. Had Roosevelt died earlier, the war's outcome might have been different. In Berlin, many are drafted into civil defense units and given meager training in resistance, and hasty defenses are being thrown up in anticipation of the expected Russian offensive. On April the 16th, the massed Red Army begins its final assault from the Oder and Nice rivers on Hitler's Germany, its main target being Berlin and the Führer himself.
Hitler now decrees that anyone ordering retreat will be shot immediately. To the north and south of Berlin, Red Army fronts break through the defensive lines and push on towards the Elbe River. But the first Belarusian front is held up with great loss of men and tanks at the Silo Heights by desperate German defense of the approaches to the city. Three days later, Zukov's front finally overcomes the defenders of Silo and races towards the suburbs of Berlin. For the next week, the people of Berlin will suffer continuous bombardment as district by district the city is taken in savage fighting. As the Battle of Berlin rages, the Western Allies occupy much of Western and Southern Germany. Patton's Third Army reaches Leipzig and then turns south in support of the US Seventh Army, taking Nuremberg and crossing into Czechoslovakia and Austria. In the north, the British take Bremen and then arrive at the Elbe, south of Hamburg. The US First and Ninth Armies reach the Elbe at Dessau and Magdeburg, but rather than advancing further, occupy its western bank. Eisenhower decides not to risk a large number of casualties in taking Berlin, which has little military importance. Rather, he lets his air forces continue their bombing of the city. He leaves Berlin to the Russians. Having crossed the River Po in northern Italy, the U.S. 5th Army takes Verona and enters Genoa, while the British 8th Army takes Venice. There is a partisan revolt in Milan. Captured Germans and their Italian collaborators are repeatedly attacked by angry crowds. Benito Mussolini, his mistress Clara Petacci, and 12 of his cabinet try to escape to Switzerland, but are caught by partisans and summarily shot. Their bodies are brought back to Milan, where they are hung upside down in the Piazzale Loreto, where 15 partisans had been shot a year before. Their bodies are repeatedly shot and spat on. Berlin is now a city in torment. Its people take shelter as best they can as the remnants of their once great armies fight on, some through fanaticism, but most through fear of the revenge atrocities that the Russians will visit upon them. District by district, street by street, the Russians destroy much of the city until on the 30th of April, with Russian troops fighting only a few hundred meters from his bunker, Hitler commits suicide in the ruins of his 1,000-year Reich. Goebbels has the body of the Führer burned and later takes his own life along with those of his wife and six daughters. He leaves behind him a devastated city of defeated, demoralized, and starving people.
Admiral Dönitz now assumes command of the remnants of the German armies and immediately tries to negotiate a separate peace with the Western Allies and continue with their help to fight the Russians. His proposal is refused, and on the 3rd of May, on Lundenberg Heath, south of Hamburg, the German High Command surrenders all German forces in the northwest to Montgomery. The German command agrees to the surrender of all, all German armed forces to the Commander-in-Chief, 21st Army Group. This to include all naval ships in these areas. These forces to lay down their arms and to surrender unconditionally. Germany is now in chaos as hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing the advancing Russians, mixed with freed Allied POWs, make their way west. We'll be singing hallelujah, marching through Berlin. We'll be singing hallelujah, marching through Berlin. When we drive those sons of Satan from their place of sin. We'll be singing hallelujah, marching through Berlin. Everywhere, German troops are now surrendering in their thousands, causing accommodation problems that the Allies at first seem reluctant to address in view of German behaviour in the war. Many of the leading Nazis now try to escape Allied justice by fleeing abroad or hiding in the mobile German population. One such is Hermann Goering, one-time commander of the Luftwaffe and one of the highest Nazi leaders. He is arrested by the U.S. 7th Army in southern Germany. He will take poison hours before he is to be hanged, leaving his wife and daughter to face an uncertain future. Finally, on the 7th of May, the German Chief of Staff, General Jodl, signs Germany's unconditional surrender to the Western Allies and Russia at 2.41 a.m. Operations cease at one minute after midnight on the 8th of May. For almost six years, the whole of Europe had been at war. Now, finally, peace returned, but to a very different Europe. May the 9th has been agreed upon as the official day of celebration. But the news of the signing of surrender leaks out on the evening of the 7th, and many people start their celebrations then. The Western Allies agree to announce the end of the European war simultaneously on May the 8th. Winston Churchill addresses the United Kingdom and its empire by radio. Over a million people crowd London streets, many packing into Trafalgar Square to hear Churchill's announcement being broadcast on public loudspeakers. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe. Hostility will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, 
the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. The German war is therefore at an end. Our gratitude to all our splendid allies goes forth from all our hearts in this island and throughout the British Empire. Advance Britannia, long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. Well, I mean, it was something we'd always expected, or I had expected that we would win the war. It never crossed my mind that we wouldn't. It was a pity it took so long, but there we are. And my cousin was down here, and I said to him, I said, where's my mother gone? Have you seen my mother? And we looked and we couldn't see her. And then we looked at these people who were dancing and she was in the middle of them. She was having a marvellous time dancing round the roundabout and, you know, enjoying herself. I was undergoing, of course, at the School of Naval Air Force Warfare in, 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 in St. Mary in Cornwall. When the news, when the news broke, somehow or other, um, my friends and I, some of my friends and I, found ourselves on the Padstow fire engine. And we were careering round North Cornwall uh, on the fire engine with all bell bells ringing. Um, and Later on, of course, there was a party of celebration in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the mess. Later, he leads both Houses of Parliament to attend a service of thanksgiving and remembrance and St Margaret's Church, Westminster. The Mall, leading to Buckingham Palace, is a solid mass of cheering men and women. King George V and Queen Elizabeth, accompanied by their daughters and Prime Minister Winston Churchill, appear several times on Buckingham Palace balcony, waving to cheering and delighted crowds. Across the whole kingdom, flags and bunting appear and they begin street parties that would use up the once carefully stored ration. Oh, everybody was joyful, and they were out in the streets, all so happy, you know. We'd all decided, well, we had to do something about this. It was such a wonderful day. So uh, we all decided now that uh, we were going to have parties. Every street in, in Tredegar, I think it was. Had a party, and uh, for the kids mostly, but then for the party, when we got together and whatever we could take, they they made some pastry out of something or other, and what else did we have? Dried eggs. Oh, that was terrible stuff. We was all squabbling about what food we would have because we'd never experienced having the food. A sandwich, you know, it was a miracle thing to just have a sandwich. But that day, tables, oh, it was fantastic. And it was a sunny day. Everybody had to change the, into their best clothes. Uh, we had Pop, Tizer, uh, Corona, um, Saxons, of course, from Brimau, uh, which, oh, we thought that was great. Ivor and I went down to the town clock. 
Everybody would say you couldn't dance, you couldn't do anything because there were too many people. But everybody was shouting and singing, and the uh, home fires burning. This was wonderful. This was wonderful. <laughs> Well, we really couldn't believe it at the time. And then there were street parties, our focal point, the town clock, quite a lot of people uh, around there, and a feeling of, well, joy and relief. But unfortunately, rationing didn't end immediately. Well, I think there was a shortage of beer at the time, so that didn't end. And it was damn weak anyway. So you could drink large quantities, and only one thing I made you do. But, um, no. Everybody seemed relieved we couldn't wait then for the war in Japan to end. Schools are closed, church bells peal, and as evening falls, the streetlights come on one by one for the first time in six long years. We were in Bournemouth. Uh, VA Day was announced. You might as well have been sitting in a cave somewhere with nobody around you. It's the only way I can describe this. I've never said that one before. Bournemouth appeared as though they'd never had a war, didn't know there was a war. There was no jubilation. There were no special lights lit up. Lights went up, obviously, but there was no special lights lit up. Nobody dancing around the fountains, as you probably learn about. And it was most disappointing as far as... I was concerned, one expected something to be a little bit more lively, find a place of light, but no, it wasn't. That was Bournemouth. Abbey Fall was a tiny little village, and I mean a tiny little village. I mean, it's not so easy, it's just bigger now. But when I went there, it was. Everybody knew everybody else. There wasn't any sort of festival, any... Uh, 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 celebrations going on as such, if you know what I mean. In London, yes, I mean, it, it was uh, fantastic, I'm told. And places like that, then it was really a madhouse. But the little villages didn't seem to do that. It's not where I was anyway. And uh, I was in the nappy, and uh, sitting there, I must have had a face as long as a kite, because one of the girls came up, she said, what's the matter with you? So I, I said, well, I said, you know, it's a VE night, and I'm, I'm skint, and I'm fat. Fed up. She says, oh, I'll lend you some money. So she lent me half a crown, two and sixpence. And I went to the one pub called the Bailey Nikujabi. I had a one pint of beer. I was sick as a dog for some reason. Went back to the bin. I went to bed. I was in bed by nine o'clock. <laughs> 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 As Churchill speaks, so too does President Truman of the USA, making his own announcement of war's end to the American people. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light. Much remains to be done. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. The whole world must be cleansed of the evil from which half the world has been free. In New York, huge crowds gather spontaneously in Times Square and across the country. Whistles and hooters are sounding. Even up here at 8th and Broadway, the paper and the confetti is blowing around and somebody must have tied down the whistle of the train. although the news is tempered by the continuing war in the Pacific.
General de Gaulle addresses his nation from the Arc de Triomphe as the population and Allied soldiers celebrate the end of hostilities. The Dutch people who had suffered near starvation under the Nazis parade and celebrate with the help of British and Canadian soldiers. You see, the Dutch were so pleased to see us because they had a bad time. They really had, I mean, they stopped the war, didn't they, to let drop food to them. That, and I mean, seven o'clock in the morning in the snow, there was barefooted children seeing what we were going to throw in a swirl bin. That's how bad it was. Never forget it, mate. We got a, ma a message the day before uh, it was finished that when it did, when it was over, we were to go up to Am and look after displaced persons. And our, our job was to administrate to them. I, I got the job of driving a ration truck, which was quite handy. <laughs> All day, 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 they, they were over the moon, weren't they? We, the, <laughs> the snaps was going around, you know. <laughs> I don't know where they found it, but they almost seemed to, all seemed to manage to have a bottle of snaps. <laughs> we managed to get hold of some cherry brandy. <laughs> we had a good drink. <laughs> <laughs> we celebrated with cherry brandy. All over Europe, victorious Allied soldiers are cheered by the end of hostilities. Some are saddened by the war's end, wanting to continue their work, others remembering fallen comrades. chased the Germans down through Germany, through a lot of unfriendly German country, and we went into Czechoslovakia. We knew it was the end of the war because we took the surrender of the German division, and we knew that that was it. There was no sort of hooray celebrations or, you know, well, that's that. You know, we're all, we're done, we're finished. But none, of, none of that, it's a feeling of, well, that's another job, John, done. I suppose we'll have to go to the Japs now. <laughs> the, the feeling was of relief. We didn't have anything to celebrate with, and I don't suppose we would have if, if we had. I was in Glasgow and I was sound asleep and I didn't know about it until the following day. I mean, all the celebrations went on the night before. I don't know, I think, in a way, almost disappointed. I think you got, uh, you got used to the army, you know, and uh, it's, it's a difficult, it's a very emotional situation. You began to think, what the hell is going to happen now? But of course, there was still Japan. So you wondered about that too. Well, it could be a better news, of course. Uh, whoever heard about it, especially people would jump, see the height, you see, from the, the happiness, you see, and the best news, you see, which uh, uh, 
I suppose through God's help, you see, has uh, again, I suppose, just uh, unexpectedly, you see, ended in that way. Uh, uh, that was uh, my reason to become SOE, Special Operation uh, Executive. I myself had the target to Hitler to get near to him, you see, be dropped, you see, in Berlin, you see, uh, and got there uh, because I was Berlin geboren. And I would try to see, become under uh, some camouflage, you see, near him, or some other opportunity, and being equipped with a revolver, or maybe a grenade or explosives, you see, just finish him off that way. Although the Western Allies have begun celebrations early, Joseph Stalin and the Russian High Command keep to the 9th of May agreement, Stalin announcing in Red Square, The age-long struggle of the Slav nations has ended in victory. Your courage has defeated the Nazis. The war is over. The Russian people who have suffered and sacrificed immensely are ecstatic on receiving the news, and in Moscow their reveling continues far into the night. As Europe celebrates, the news travels around the world, reaching those still fighting the Japanese. C5 Alvin Silver, where are you from, Alvin? New York City. New York City. I see you're reading the Germany Fritz news. What do you think of it? Oh, it makes me feel great. It makes me think this thing will be all over soon. Making me back to New York how much sooner, right? You bet. As soon as we finish this over here. Good, Alvin. Thanks for that. Okay. It's a great day here. We've had a lot of great news. I hope that we soon get things ended up over here and that we can all be back home before very long. But you can't say the Navy isn't doing its part. Well, all I can say is I'm very happy to be in this area when the hostilities have ceased over in Europe. And it gives me great pleasure to be here and uh, help finish the war in the Pacific area as soon as possible and all get back home safely. Well, this is one of the two days that we Filipinos have been waiting for so long. I think we have only one more to go now. NCFC Toledo Vine of Kansas City, Missouri. Let's hear what she has to say about PE Day. I think it is too good to be true. Allied forces in this eastern theater of war are relieved of worry about families at home and hope for reinforcements and resources from the western theater. We were delighted when we heard the news of victory in Europe. VE Day was wonderful news to us from every point of view. Of course, uh, the fact that it was victory after the years of fighting was fantastic. We also knew that it was going to help us because there would be parts of the Army and Air Force and Navy would be transferred to support us in the Far East and therefore that was good news from a selfish point of view that we would get that much more support. Uh, we weren't in a position, we were fighting, so we weren't in a position to have any parties or celebrations or whatever. Uh, there might have been a few extra rations of rum, I don't remember, but we were fighting, it was just another day in terms of fighting, it didn't change anything. Uh, as far as uh, our daily routine was concerned, our war was going on. We were all overjoyed and we were happy to hear about that news. There, there, there was a sort of celebration because the war had not really ended uh, 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 on our side, you see. But there was a celebration 
to the because of the 90% of the my colleagues were from britain the army officers and they naturally felt relieved that they were their family they were safe now back in europe people begin to come to terms with what war has done to them many see little reason to celebrate and uh, we took bologna and then we uh, after that we came that the german has capitulated and the war uh, has ended but it didn't end for us because we knew that the, the russian occupied the whole country when we were liberating the italian soil from the german the uh, the allies of, of our allies russia was occupied our, and were occupying our country most people don't like war and uh, when it finished we were we were in two two minds a we were glad that hostilities finished but b we knew very well that we could not would not be able to return back to our country it, it, for us, it, was, it, it wasn't really a victory. It wasn't. It was rather a, uh, one of the saddest days that, you know, the war has ended and that we cannot return to, 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 to Poland. So that was the most rather. It wasn't, it wasn't really a jubilation. In this country, they, they were, you know, hooray, everything is okay. But for us, no. Others see the need to pass their experiences on as a lesson and a warning to future generations. We've, we've all heard of Auschwitz, the concentration camp, because there were several, or quite a number of concentration camps. The best known was Auschwitz and Ravensbrück and so on, but there's also one just south of Hamburg at Neuengamme, and I visited there one day is a typical concentration camp, shower bars in enormous gas chambers. Terrifying. It makes one that creep to stand in this place where thousands of Jews and other unwanted human beings were gassed and burnt. And ironically, when I was there, it was used as a prison or detention camp for SS, who had been rounded up by the British Army. So instead of housing inmates for gassing, we had SS troops waiting to be punished for their little deeds. When the war ended, I was just south of Hamburg. And of course, we were all delighted. Then, all sorts of noise, of course, we weren't in near any pubs, that sort of thing. So we had to celebrate by making noise and sending off tracer bullets, letting off hand, hand grenades, making all sorts of noise to celebrate. That was the 8th of May. 1945. The end of the war was announced, and I begged of the soldiers, don't shoot your rifles. Don't. Everybody used to fire off their rifles. It's a dangerous thing. They'll think the Nazis coming back. And that's what happened. Many of them, God forbid, I don't know how many died. I hope none of them died. But they were all terrified. And... Um, there was a great, was a great, great joy, a great joy. You know, Friday night, the Sabbath it begins at Sabbath. It's a very holy moment. And some of the girls uh, come and make kiddush for us. You know, sanctify the Sabbath in our hut. I apparently had given them candles to light during the week, and maybe a bottle of wine. I don't remember. But when I came in the hut, it wasn't as long as this. But one part of it, people were dead and others were dying. And the other side was several women with a young girl on the lap of one of the women. That was her, the mother. I didn't know what to put myself. All the laws of cleanliness and purity and sanctity just flew out of the window. Don't know what, how can I make Kiddush and these things? 
where I made kiddush, and they asked me to eat something. They said it was gefilte fish. Have you ever heard of the expression? I was terrified to eat it, but I couldn't refuse. And I believe that caused the diarrhea. Well, can you imagine a relief? And at the same time, sorrow, you know, because they think how many of our families or any other families, how many people were destroyed, and how many thousands, thousands of innocent people. So it was a great, great relief that they eventually surrender. I feel those atrocities and those experiences, not only my and everybody else who were unfortunate time when I was, should tell the story and, and should never be forgotten. The political map of Europe has changed irrevocably after the largest conflict the world has ever known, a conflict that introduced industrial and global war on a huge scale. That scale was not only matched by the barbarity and savagery, but also the courage of many to face up to unprecedented evil. The future will bring two superpowers into rivalry facing each other along a line running through conquered Germany. That line, to be dubbed the Iron Curtain by Churchill, although destined to eventually disappear, will split Europe and the world. Although many millions have died, all of the Allies ensure that from this catastrophe, new beginnings are to grow. This day, at any rate, represents a moment of hope.